The competition between the taxi industry and ride-sharing companies is moving from the marketplace to the state house. Officials are considering new regulations to strike a balance between market power and consumer protection. Among those presenting ideas are researchers at the Pioneer Institute. We'd like to welcome as our guest from the Institute, a research associate, Matt Blackburn. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Matt. Thank you for having me. Well, you've come up with some idea here. I guess the first thing people want to, is protection from a bad driver uh, who maybe shouldn't even be behind the wheel. So w what should we be doing? Well, when you look at what Uber and Lyft and other ride-sharing groups have employed across the country, it's a pretty sound background check. Uh, it's a third-party check, and it's basically what you see in groups like the Boy Scouts, Care.org. Uh, it's what you're seeing them employ. And what we're seeing right now in the state are basically two options. Uh, one would uh, basically allow these companies to continue that, but would also require a state background check. Second option would do that in addition to a fingerprint check, which would enter a completely different territory and one that we're actually not seeing currently in the tax industry. So wh what is it about uh, the fingerprinting itself? D does that really give you new information or is that mainly just a kind of uh, uh, something to have in case something goes wrong down the road? It's, it's a good question. And I mean, essentially what it does is it uh, checks with an FBI database. And that database is essentially a series of records on, um, on arrests. So it doesn't give you any conclusive information on convictions or arrests, or excuse me, on uh, the degree to which someone actually poses legitimate risk. Um, and we're not seeing that as something that's implemented by taxi groups uh, across Massachusetts too. I mean, it's not uh, mandated by law. What you are seeing uh, you know, it's the Hackney um, Carriage Unit, and they're the ones that regulate Boston taxis. They've suggested that they're willing to employ it if TNCs, Uber and Lyft, uh, have the same standard applied. But the bottom line here is that there's a very effective background check mechanism in place currently. So why is it necessary to go through this process that really doesn't give you conclusive evidence about risk? Now, I, I, I don't know about, I mean, we've had some bad experiences here with some of the ride service drivers. And mm -hmm. in the West Coast, uh, prosecutors have been saying that there, there have been some bad people uh, driving these cars who, who got through the cracks. So, I mean, would your uh, recommendation prevent that? You know, I, I think we're all basing this on anecdotes now, right? We're in a very early stage for these companies. And uh, with any new business model, there are certain risks that come about, uh, especially with respect to public safety when transportation is concerned. But I think that what they've done is uh, ensured that as they grow, they're incorporating new features into what they do in a way that addresses those concerns. I mean, there really isn't any legitimate data to confirm that these companies present more of a risk than any of the taxi companies that currently operate in any city in the country. So well, well we, we have problems with both of them. That's but, correct. But, but you yes. want to make sure that, that we, we have as few as possible. Now, one of the other problems, uh, maybe we hear more about this from the ride-sharing companies themselves, right. is that the taxi industry discriminates too much. They, they're mm -hmm. so strict with their background checks that a lot of people who maybe uh, were ex-offenders uh, don't get a chance. This is in the tax industry? Yes. Right. I'm, I mean, one of the benefits of this kind of new model is that it democratizes that process in a much more, in, in a way that actually provides a little bit more economic opportunity. Um, I mean, the hiring process of Uber and Lyft and these other companies uh, have been celebrated as a kind of renaissance in giving more people, regardless of race or ethnic background or gender, uh, an opportunity to pursue part-time work in conjunction with full-time work and all these kind of flexible elements that are married to this kind of uh, new uh, era in labor markets. So I, my answer would be that when you're looking at uh, what these companies are doing, uh, you have to understand that it's directly tied to the flexibility that they offer. Well, take me a little bit beyond just the flexibility. Uh, mm. how, how do you keep drivers from getting ripped off? And we've had a problem with this with, with the, the taxi cab industry for a long right. time. The globe has taken a deep dive into that. Absolutely. So what's the best thing to do about that for state regulations? Well, with ride sharing, I mean, the, the issue has very much been resolved insofar as, I mean, like a lot of the other features that they've introduced, uh, they basically eliminate transactions that require handling of cash, handling of means of payment, and that in many ways eliminates the uh, concern that a driver will be ripped off in a certain scenario. So uh, from a regulatory standpoint, any bill that essentially 
uh, allows these applications to consider with the, uh, continue with these same features would be appropriate. And I think at the same time, uh, an appropriate uh, way forward for the tax industry would be to give them incentives to incorporate the same features and allow them to uh, basically compete in a more effective way with these companies. Because right now they can't due to the very, very restrictive nature of that regulatory uh, framework. And another concern here is how you protect consumers, especially if the vehicle is in an accident and the passenger gets hurt. Uh, Again, that's an area where the taxi industry has presented a lot of problems. Uh, what do we need to protect consumers when we talk about ride sharing? Absolutely. I, I think you can look at a series of options here that are being considered. Um, one uh, is quite an onerous one, and it's essentially the requirement that uh, all Uber and Lyft drivers and ride sharing company drivers carry $1 million in commercial insurance. Very, it's, it's problematic insofar as uh, you look at the nature of the labor market in, for those companies. You know, we're talking about people, over half of them work 15 hours a week. Uh, almost half of them have another separate full-time job. Uh, so that requirement uh, is excessive, right? But there are ways to ensure that there's an, an insurance structure that protects riders and drivers. And I think what Uber has in place now is something that they've really worked hard uh, in conjunction and partnership with uh, insurance companies to develop. And that's essentially something that covers this concern of the insurance gap, right? And the insurance gap was essentially the stage at which uh, a driver uh, had not accepted an, uh, a, excuse me, had not accepted a ride, but the app was on. And what they're doing now is providing a certain amount of coverage during that framework. And once the driver has accepted a ride, it's a million dollars from that point forward. So there's a way to reconcile these concerns. So how do you structure the insurance? Because uh, it, it certainly would be too burdensome if each and every driver, especially the freelancers, had to get right. all that insurance. But, but isn't there a way to pool this uh, so uh, to, the company can bear it, but, but it's not too burdensome for the company? Right. And, and I think as I described that, the, that kind of separating the uh, stage, the stages of a ride into separate categories for varying levels of insurance coverage is the answer. And what you're seeing, I mean, look at Geico, look at uh, all these other um, farmers, all these major companies, they have ex openly expressed that they want to work with these companies. And what they're doing is they're coming up with really innovative channels through which they can essentially tie uh, certain miles to uh, documented um, miles traveled for uh, ride-sharing trips. Um, they're coming up with all these solutions that really kind of trump anything that's being proposed in the legislature right now. So, I mean, not to say that the market will automatically fix this issue itself, but what you're seeing is a very dynamic group of options here that could all be a good answer. Thank you very much for being with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Matt Blackburn from the Pioneer Institute. We'll have more news in just a moment.